Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome back to the public hearings by the Commission of Inquiry. Uh, we will now hear the testimonies uh, from the Bizan Center for Research and Development. Uh, we will be joined online by the Executive Director, Mr. Ubay uh, Al Abudi, and we have presence here of uh, Hanan Hussein as well. So, Ubay, good afternoon. Uh, good to see you. Please, please continue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the testimony will be started by my colleague, Hanan, if that's okay. And then I will follow up after her. I think he wants you to go first. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. My name is Hanan Hussain, and I work with Bisan Center for Research and Development. I'd like to thank you for giving us this opportunity to reflect our situation uh, within uh, the UN Commission of Inquiry. Uh, I will start by introducing uh, our organization. So, Bisan Center for Research and Development is a 33-year-old organization that was established in 1989 by a group of Palestinian progressives as a think tank uh, aimed at researching emergent issues within the Palestinian society from development, socio-economy, gender, health, uh, to politics. Um, the organization uh, has since then developed and uh, become a, a space for academic research as well as a space for youth groups and uh, grassroots organizations to benefit from. BISAN implements different projects and programs that serve its vision for development, for freedom and justice. Uh, BISAN uh, defines itself as a democratic, progressive civil society organization that seeks to contribute to, building, uh, of a pal uh, to the building of a Palestinian civil, democratic, effective and active community. Uh, our work helps define the different social and political structures that govern development, uh, or in Palestine's case, uh, the de-development of the Palestinian society, and have never been shy to show the complicity or failures of different duty bearers, whether international, local, the occupying state of Israel, uh, or even the private sector in Palestine. And we have faced restrictions and attacks from all of the above in the course of our work. Uh, the work we are being prosecuted uh, for includes doing research on human rights violations and in Bissan's particular case, the violations of socioeconomic and cultural rights of Palestinians living under the occupation. The center employs a human rights-based approach in its work and some of the research that we have managed to produce since the designation and attacks are, uh, the first is the enabling uh, an environment for civil society organizations in the West Bank in Gaza, uh, land grabbing in the West Bank, uh, philanthropy in the Palestinian context, uh, political participation for youth, women, and people with disabilities in the local elections cycle in the West Bank, and shrinking space for women activists in the West Bank and Gaza, uh, which is uh, this research in particular is a research that Bissan was conducting before the designation to highlight shrinking space for women activists by the occupation right-wing groups in the PA. Uh, and during the course of our research, uh, a Palestinian activist uh, named Nizar Banat was murdered during his arrest by the PA. Uh, and then after demonstrations against his murder broke out in the streets with people calling for uh, presidential and legislative elections and the rights and the freedom of association and the freedom of speech. Uh, during the demonstrations, PA uh, forces attacked HRDs and specifically targeted women activists by beating them up, stealing their phones and belongings, and then proceeded by publishing women's personal information and photos they found on their phones after. Uh, the center documented these violations by uh, interviewing uh, uh, the women that were attacked and published a specific report within the study uh, to highlight the PA's unprecedented attacks on women during demonstrations. Um, Basically, the Israeli designation of Bissan uh, does not constitute the first time the center has been attacked. Uh, Israel's 
shrinking space of civil society is historical and systematic. Bissan has been targeted through various raids, arrests of personnel, and online smear campaigns by anti-Palestinian Israeli platforms. The designation has impacted Bissan in various ways, uh, the first being financial, as Bissan has had to put a lot of financial resources to fight the designation through campaigning and advocacy, not to mention that some of our prospective partners and donors halted their funding because of the legality of the designation and its consequences on them. Uh, the second is our human resources, as we are short-staffed. Uh, we are a short-staffed organization that had work double for us in terms of having to now advocate against the designation, was keeping track on our normal work and the implementation of our research programs and, pro uh, and projects. Uh, we have also had to find different venues for us to hold our workshops, trainings, and events, even though we have a very uh, uh, big office in uh, Ramallah. But we had to find different venues for us um, bec because when we have our um, trainings and events with beneficiaries, uh, we are still afraid of their safety uh, from uh, the occupation as they can be prosecuted, prosecuted for entering our offices based on the designation. Um, in addition, our day-to-day -day, uh, operations were impacted from the last trade in August as they took all of our equipment, devices, and files and made the office an unsafe area for us as employees to work comfortably in. Uh, since the declaration, we as employees have been living at risk of being arrested, prosecuted, uh, travel banned, and harassed by the Israeli occupation forces. Uh, we are working on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of we don't know what might happen to us, to our work, to our organization, and our lives. Um, as employees, we take pride in uh, our work, and we believe in the vision of the Center, Development for Freedom, Justice, and Equality. And we feel that we have grown both professionally and personally while working to promote a development paradigm for all uh, that leaves no s social segment behind in the development progress process. Um, one thing that we that can be seen from all of this repression is that this is a terror campaign conducted by Israel against the organizations and their employees, serving as a stepping stone. They, they, this campaign would eventually prevent activists, uh, particularly women, uh, from participating in public life and thus shrinking our public spaces and limiting the uh, ability of Palestinians to access international mechanisms in order to hold human rights violators uh, accountable. Um, although the vast majority of states released uh, uh, that there is no evidence to justify the crackdown and designation of Palestinian CSOs, but nonetheless the door has been kept open for Israeli occupation forces to practice more violations in the name of gathering and collecting more evidence. And we all uh, we know well how Israel collects its evidence through the use of torture mechanisms, illegal surveillance, evidence planting, and trying to and trying people in front of an illegal occupation system that is designed to keep the Palestinian people subjugated to human rights violations. As long as these violations are in place, we cannot as, as Palestinian civil society function normally. This does not mean that we will stop our work at all, uh, but it means that uh, international protection mechanisms should be enacted to help uh, protect the Palestinian civil society organizations and its employees in the face of military repression. Um, finally, uh, we have already been attacked as our director has been banned from traveling, and uh, we have discovered that his phone was infiltrated using Pegasus spyware surveillance. Um, I will stop here and give Obai, um, our director, the chance to broaden more on the issue. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Alaboudi, uh, I'll give you the floor, and then we, we, we may have some questions for both of you. Please go ahead and please also explain the restrictions you yourself are facing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. And uh, thank you, Hanan, for this elaborate uh, presentation. First of all, let me just, I want to uh, extend uh, my greetings and my solidarity with Ala Abdel Fattah, the Egyptian human rights defender, who is uh, currently uh, facing the uh, entire machine of the state that is falling down on him and his family. Uh, hopefully he will be free and this is uh, 
Hopefully his issue will be part of the issues that will be discussed in COP27. Uh, for Bissan Center, uh, the story of Bissan is the story of the Palestinian people since 1989, I would say. As our center was started by a group of academics and uh, progressives with a clear uh, linkage between uh, their approach to development uh, that is uh, challenging the current paradigms that were implemented in uh, Palestine and their approach also to uh, basic rights, that human rights are uh, unalienable, uh, undivisible, and uh, that the development process is a basic human right, of course. So the center from 1989 uh, functioned even before the establishment of the PA and uh, was one of the founding seven organizations of the Palestinian Non-Governmental Organizations Network, PINGO, the Palestinian Coalition for Civil Society, the well-known. And uh, the center has continued in this vision, trying to enact development that would encompass everyone and promote for freedom. This, unfortunately, in a situation where there are asymmetrical power relations in the political system, where every political system in between the river and the sea violates basic Palestinian human rights. You as a Palestinian have basically zero to no rights, even the right to life, the most basic right, we don't have it. This has put the center with uh, challenges and uh, in confrontation, I would say, with all the powers that are here, whether it was the occupation forces that have raided our offices twice since last year, once in uh, July 2021 and another time in August 2022. Both raids are, of course, illegal, and both raids there was property destruction and stealing the equipment of the organization. But the violations against the center even date before that, as for us as an organization. I myself was arrested in 2019, uh, put on administrative detention, and uh, just uh, one week before traveling to uh, Istanbul, Turkey, to participate in the apartheid conference. And this was before the entire, uh, or the major human rights organizations published their apartheid reports. Uh, two days after that conference, I was supposed to give a talk in the European Parliament on the uh, torture of Palestinian prisoners by the Israeli occupation forces. I was uh, detained, put in uh, administrative detention in 2019, and people were tortured in order to get a conviction against me personally. This is well documented in the various human rights reports that have been published since my arrest and my release. Uh, the violations against Bissan, unfortunately, have not just been from the oh, the occupation forces, but also uh, Palestinian Authority. I am saddened to say that today um, the Palestinian security forces shut down an activity uh, uh, for the uh, popular conference on reforming the PLO through general elections that were being held in the uh, 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 in the headquarters of the uh, uh, conference that is right next to Bissan. Our organization was also, uh, we had to uh, uh, to send the staff home in fear of their safety from the assault by the PA forces. And we actually could not even continue our work today in, the, in this regard. Um, I personally was arrested uh, twice last year in the wake of demonstrations demanding justice for Nizar Banat by the PA security forces, demanding uh, general elections, and demanding the, the uh, respect of basic uh, laws and freedoms for the Palestinian people. Uh, with me were arrested other employees of the organizations and board members of the Bissan Center. Um, and, um, October uh, 2021, I also found out that my phone has been hacked for almost a year by the Pegasus software, or spyware, that is not software, where malicious uh, spyware was targeting me, downloading everything on my phone, and even had the ability to manipulate the data on my phone. 
the Pegasus issue is well known and well documented and has been released on a global scale as the interactions between the Israeli occupation and human rights violations of Palestinians and their impact on the status of human rights and human rights defenders globally. For, uh, for me, after I gave the, my first testimony in private to the uh, Commission of Inquiry in March 2022, uh, then in the 10th of April, there was a travel ban against me that was issued. I did not know of it until the 29th of April, where I was supposed to participate in the World Social Forum in Mexico, and then continue on a speaking tour in the United States, especially in the East Coast, addressing members of Congress on the impact of the designations and the issue of Palestinian human rights, and the interconnections between Palestinian human rights and the facilitation of U.S. funding for Israel for these uh, human rights violations. I myself am a dual citizen. I'm a Palestinian American also. So I can say that I have uh, a bit of a peek on the both worlds of what's happening. Since the 10th of April, uh, or since the 29th of April, I was not given prior notice. Uh, we've been asking through our lawyers at Dallas Center for the decision for my travel ban. Is it continuous? Is it... Uh, 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 what are the reasons behind it, who issued the decision. No response was received. On the 1st of June, I was I had another invitation by the United Nations ESQA committee on discussing a report on the economic evascuation of uh, uh, the Palestinian, on the evascuation of the Palestinian economy. I was supposed to participate in this workshop in uh, Amman, Jordan. Um, although we, my, through my lawyers, we asked several times if there is still a travel ban, no uh, response was given to us from the Israeli military, although their military uh, instructions uh, or laws say that when you ask a question like that, they are obliged to reply within three working days, and this did not happen. Uh, I was travel banned again on the 1st of June, and after much uh, legal work or legal correspondence. The only piece of uh, information I got about my travel ban that it is ongoing, that it is also started since the 10th of April, which I would say the dates that uh, they got hold maybe or they got knowledge of my participation with the Commission of Inquiry in Jordan. Bissan, uh, through this repression, Bissan and us as employees, as people working on this issue, have continued our work. You heard some of the published uh, work that we have done. We have not backed down on doing, uh, on promoting development model for all. And we have continued actually also publishing our research challenging the status quo. Uh, we are, I think that we are part an academic research organization and other part, uh, we consider ourselves as part of the Palestinian broader social movement. Uh, Bissan Center is not just a pillar of Palestinian civil society. We are also members have been voted since uh, December as members of the uh, Pingo Steering Committee. Uh, and uh, we help actually uh, facilitate this kind of discussion and uh, 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 interaction between Palestinian civil society, the PA, international civil society, UN agencies. Bissan Center has been involved in the Palestinian development process. We have also been involved in criticizing development approaches that uh, for us, uh, it was clear that it would not work. We were criticizing the privatized development model, where uh, people have, uh, through development interventions, have become billionaires, while the rest of the population has sunken deeper and deeper into poverty. Our research is critical. We use a human rights-based approach, are critical for all uh, duty bearers. Uh, and we stand by uh, the people, the marginalized, and we are proud of that as a center. For uh, us as an organization, we can see and uh, I would say feel 
the double standards that have been employed against Palestinians in respect to other cases and causes globally. Uh, for us, and maybe for me also as a dual citizen, I would say that at this moment, uh, I would feel also the inaction of governments where action is needed. And I would also feel that uh, for just being a Palestinian, you basically have no rights. You basically are, enjoy no protections under either Palestinian law or under even Israeli occupation law, which is actually even the rights guaranteed under it are not uh, being held up. Um, the issue is for us uh, an issue of survival, not just for the organizations, but also for the Palestinian community, because these organizations represent, I would say, uh, a form of uh, self-organizing for the Palestinian community, where people of conscience come together and try to push for a better future for all. I would stop here, and uh, I would be happy to answer any questions or remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. Aboudi, Ms. Hussein, for your introductory comments. Um, we would certainly like to ask some questions and, and get more detail from you, in particular in relation to specific incidents or situations that have confronted you and confronted Bissan. Um, Mr. Al Aboudi, I un understand you've had three periods in Israeli administrative detention, is that correct? Yes, I was arrested by Israel several times. Um, could you take them one by one and give us the, 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 the circumstances of each of those arrests uh, and tell us whether they were administrative detention or criminal charges? Oh, okay, uh, let me continue. Hmm. Sorry, I did not mean to interrupt. Uh, are you finished? It's all right, yes. Yeah. Okay, the first time uh, for... Okay, it's very important to understand that for a Palestinian, there is no legal system. Um, I would start from the last... Uh, because the last one was really obvious, even in their own words. So from your mouth, I condemn you. This is, I think, the most uh, elaborate thing. In my last arrest, the judge came out and said that there are evidentiary difficulties in the case file against me. I was first put on administrative detention. There was a global campaign that was signed on by Nobel laureates, by academics, uh, over 5,000 uh, academics, even Israeli ones, signed uh, letters in uh, demanding my release. And uh, there was uh, actually uh, pressure from the Israeli occupation forces on people in order to uh, transfer me from an administrative detention into a case. Of, uh, and when you're saying that transferred into a case, this is not based on solid evidence. And uh, this is based only on hearsay. This is based only on confessions obtained under torture. Uh, the judge, uh, my main actually uh, aim while I was being arrested was to get back to my family. The judge in the trial said that there are evidentiary difficulties in the file and nonetheless convicted. This is actually documented in an official Israeli uh, case file against me. The other arrests was were years ago, one when I was a student in the universities. And uh, these arrests, of course, they follow also the same suit. There are always problems with the evidence. There are always problems with the uh, uh, persecution of, Palestine, of uh, the case that they present against us. In uh, one of the previous arrests uh, from the first day, I was told by my lawyer that they want you to remain 14 months in jail. And I told him, for what? And he said, they want you to remain 14 months in jail. And in the end of the 14 months, I was released. 
uh, previous arrests also relied on confessions obtained under torture, on trumped up charges, on charges that are not actually, if you go and examine them in the field, they have the, no concrete action that they are talking about. So on the, these earlier occasions, did they also lead to criminal charges or on each occasion was it con continued only as administrative detention? Well, look, in the end, you are always guilty, found out guilty. They always put you in the Israeli system. They actually, according to their own figures, they have a 99.9% per, uh, conviction rate. And this is official data from Israeli uh, uh, from the Israeli courts, Israeli military courts. So the idea of, of, of a Palestinian being found not guilty in Israeli court is really absurd. Uh, because what they rely on is actually there is no due process. So they criminalize you, yes, in the sense that they uh, put on a, a charge sheet. And when people, of course, hear that there's a charge sheet, oh, there must be have something done. And then when you look at the charge sheet and you look at the details of the charge sheet, then you find out that there is actually not even a single case there is. My convictions, my arrests have been totally based on, uh, what do you call it, uh, fictional data. Not even one concrete case has been presented against me. And even uh, when uh, you as a Palestinian go in front of a military court, you are put in a bargain. Like the last time I was put in a bargain, I was also considering the case of our friend Mohammed Halabi, who is the, who was the court division director of Gaza. We know that the case against him isn't true. They know even that the charges that they brought against him does not even have one concrete action that he did in violations of the law. But nonetheless, they were uh, they convicted him. So as a Palestinian, you find yourself facing two options, though both are bitter. The first one of accepting a plea bargain and getting a reduced sentence, and the second one is refusing that and spending many more years in prison. But in either way, there is no way for you to be released from prison. And you can, of course, check the reports of uh, uh, prisoner support organizations such as Adamir, where you will find enough and ample data and evidence on that. So treating the Israeli military system, court system, and now I would also say the Israeli civilian court system, that it is a system that presents equal rights and due process for the Palestinians, this is, I think, a farce by itself. What, um, what were the actual charges that have been made against you on these occasions? Well, it's always the regular. It's always belonging to an illegal organization. It's always uh, uh, relating to uh, being active among uh, the social Palestinian social movement or the Palestinian students. And it has always focused on uh, trying to, I would say, uh, uh, smear even, even the, uh, like uh, for me, it's smearing even the reputation of uh, my reputation. So these kinds of uh, charges, those are what are being uh, presented. And those kinds of charges are actually what, pe what Palestinians are being convicted upon. I am now also am a leader of uh, or a director of uh, uh, an illegal organization. According to the same, they actually declared the organizations illegal according to the same laws that they declared all Palestinian parties illegal. And uh, now they can even charge me on the same basis, legal basis that they present. Um, what was the or what were the illegal organizations in the past? Well, they charged me uh, once with belonging to uh, a student body. And once again, this last uh, arrest, they charged me of being a member of a PFLP. And uh, have you been a member of the PFLP? Of course not. One of the allegations made at the time of the designation of Bissan as a terrorist organization was that these Bissan funds were going to the PFLP. Um, have any funds from Bissan been paid directly or indirectly to the PFLP? 
Well, Bissam, we have actually, this is actually an offense by itself, if, the, if they have any proof or evidence of that. They did not even need to designate the organizations. If they could have even one proof that we actually mismanaged any of our money. Our money is being audited on several levels. The first one, it's being audited by an internal auditor other than the employees. Then we also have an external auditor. We also, as uh, Palestinian civil society, are being audited by the Palestinian uh, Monetary Authority and the uh, uh, Palestinian anti-corruption uh, entity that is in Palestine and the Palestinian uh, Oversight uh, Bureau. So all of those levels of audits, and we have always, as Bissan, had complete audit reports throughout the years of our work. We have always been some of the best performing organizations. As Bissan, actually, we partnered with every major donor in history, including the World Bank back in 2004, I think. We contributed in building up the capacities of all Palestinian civil society. So the, uh, the mere... Uh, nonsense of thinking that uh, there can be any financial mistreatment of the Palestinian money, of the money that is, uh, I think, uh, or I say, coming to Palestinian civil society organizations, this is actually so absurd that uh, nobody can even believe that. In our organization, we have always passed all audits with flying colors. We have always had one of the best track records of uh, financial management and transparency. Uh, just following up on that, did any of the audits at all raise any questions about how BISAN funds were spent or paid? No, not at all. Not even one audit report in the past 32 years of our work. Mm -hmm. We as an organisation, we believe that we are also a learning organisation. So we always have uh, this drive to improve. We've been instrumental in adopting, for example, for Pingo, the, uh, what do you call it, uh, the resource kit on good governance for organizations, which included uh, how to adopt m and manuals, how to have the financial segregation of duties, how to have oversight, how to have transparency. Um, the organization is uh, managed by a board of directors that is elected every three years. We have a general assembly that convenes every year. And we have this kind of oversight system, several layers of it, to ensure that there is no financial mismanagement of the money. You referred to two, I think, regulatory bodies established by the Palestinian Authority. Yes. Um, do they close their eyes to expenditure or payments to PFLP? Of course not. And these, uh, this actually, even in the Palestinian uh, civil society law, law number one for the year 2000, it talks about that uh, the resources and uh, uh, whether financial or physical of the organizations cannot be used for the benefit of any political party. This offense would have even closed us. We have performed our work according to the highest standards of the Palestinian law and international, of course, regulations. Thank you. Um, were you given any advance warning or were you asked to comment before the terrorist designation was made? Actually, no, we were the last to know. I was being contacted by journalists. Uh, the contact from journalists uh, uh, asking me about the terror designation, and I was telling them uh, I did not know that. We would uh, let me ask my lawyers or the lawyers of the organization uh, to understand it. Then, a couple of hours later, we understood the severity and the impact of the designation. We were not given prior warning. We were not given, uh, I would say, uh, even my travel ban, I was not given prior warning. I was not given even, uh, or have anyone held accountable for the illegal hack of my personal phone with the Pegasus spyware. And all of this is being, is happening while we as organizations uh, 
uh, adhere to the Palestinian laws and to international uh, standards for the operations of civil society. And after the designation, were you given any information of the basis on which the designation was made? Well, our lawyers went to the military commander and they asked for the evidence in order to study the possibility of uh, uh, submitting uh, what do you call it? Submitting an objection, and the evidence that was handed over was it was stated in an official letter from them that uh, the main body of evidence is secret, and based on the secret evidence, you're being designated. And for the open part of the evidence, I think the Intercept and Plus Nine Seven Two magazine have done a wonderful job talking about the quality of this evidence, the public part of it, and how it's actually non-evidence against the organizations. Right. In relation to the travel ban, were you given any explanation when the ban was uh, came to your attention as to the basis on which it was made? I was not given any explanation on this uh, travel ban. I was not even given the order itself. I've been asking just, I did not even challenge the order yet. I've been just asking for the, and not even the evidence. I've been asking for since April until today, this is seven months almost. I've been asking just for the order itself. What is the order? What are its details? Who issued it? In order to go to the next, uh, legal challenge. And until now, this is also evidently a secret evidence. Okay. And in relation to the raids on the Bissan office, um, was Bissan asked in advance to provide certain information or to hand over laptops or to do anything before the raids took place? Well, of course not. That we were not asked. And we also, I need to emphasize this, that we operate under Palestinian law. We are registered with the Palestinian Authority, and they have the responsibility of oversight and uh, making sure that we are operating according to the law. And uh, if any such request came from the PA or any of the regulatory bodies that are working according to PA laws, we would be more than happy to cooperate with any of that. But with the raids to the offices, they stole everything. When I say they stole everything, they even stole the landlines that we had in our offices. They stole the photocopiers. They even stole in the first raid in 2021 a piece of marble that had the name of Bissan uh, engraved in it that has accompanied the center from the early days of its establishment back in 1989. So you can ask me what kind of uh, information they could take from that. I think this is uh, just a message for us that Palestinians, we have nothing and can own nothing if the Israeli occupation forces decide that. So it's basically they took everything from the office, from printers to papers to books, whatever, and they left a destruction trail in their wake without being offered a single uh, legal recourse to challenge any of that. In July 2021, we tried to challenge it and request uh, for our, our stuff, our laptops, our uh, desktops that were uh, taken. And I would actually refrain from the using the word confiscation because confiscation is done, uh, takes like a legal aspect. This is out highway robbery of the organization. We operate under Palestinian laws. If there was any misconduct or any information, they could have the Palestinian Authority come and did any investigations. And we have been audited so many times over the years that I don't think that anyone has in his mind uh, an idea uh, or uh, a suspicion that we are not operating according to law. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I also have a couple of questions. Uh, one was related to the, uh, that I think both of you have raised in different ways, the issue of uh, shrinking space for civil society, that it's historic and systemic. And I wanted to ask either one of you or both of you to 
uh, speak a bit more about that uh, when you say historic and systemic uh, is it something is it a pattern you see from the beginning of the occupation is it something that has increased in recent years and and how has that um, impacted your own work uh, Can you? Definitely. <laughs> I was waiting to see. Um, yeah, it is historic and it is systemic, I think, because um, civil society organizations are the backbone of Palestinian society. They've always been there to document uh, violations uh, against human rights. They've always been there to actually benefit the Palestinian community in terms of uh, giving services, in terms of research, in terms of you know feminist organizations asking for laws, adopting, adapting, uh, changing. Um, and this is something that does not fit well with the occupation when it's trying to re-engineer the Palestinian civil society and actually you know, demolish Palestinian civil society where they have people who are just subjugated and do not, uh, uh, you know, do not uh, struggle, do not resist against uh, the occupation. Uh, all of the organizations have been raided before. Uh, personnel have been uh, uh, arrested. You have smear campaigns, online smear yep. campaigns by Israeli platforms that have been, um, you know, issuing uh, uh, statements and facts, but have been, you know, they've they turn facts into, you know, into uh, smear campaigns. They turn uh, like some details into things like they highlight it in, in terms of like uh, this is you know the terrorist civil society in Palestine uh, and uh, this is what they're doing so and they have poured so much you know financial and human resource capacities into this they have governmental uh, institutions that work mainly on um, you know, fighting civil society organizations in Palestine and trying to get uh, uh, like international donors and partners to stop funding uh, civil society. This is the designation is almost, you know, uh, uh, you know, the last uh, straw of what they're doing. But this is not something that has not been done before. But the smear campaigns uh, preceded the designation, right? Yes. Of course, they have preceded. They have these smear campaigns. If you if you look at some of their p platforms, uh, you know they have people on it. They have organizations. They have international organizations. Uh, you know donors, partners, um, and then you they show you pictures. If you're at a wedding, uh, and like a. a you know, someone at the wedding is part of a political faction and you happen right. to be in the same picture, then this is evidence that you're part of this, you know, political affiliation or whatever. And this is what they do. They don't care for facts. They don't care for statements. And all that they, they want to do is to smear civil society in Palestine. And this is not just something about Bissan. This is all of civil society and international donors or partners that stand beside Palestinian civil society. And you have done, Avisan has done particular work on, I think you mentioned it, on shrinking space for, um, which is historic and systemic, for women activists. Can mm -hmm. you speak a bit more about that? So we started the research uh, to talk about uh, shrinking space for women activists by the occupation, the PA, and uh, right-wing groups. Um, in terms of uh, specifically for women activists that work with organizations that are trying to adapt and adopt, to get the PA to adapt and adopt uh, laws that better serve Palestinian women, uh, uh, specifically the family protection law. Uh, and they have faced a lot of criticism by uh, right-wing uh, groups, also smear campaigns. Uh, they tried to, you know, character assassinate, uh, you know, feminist activists and women activists online. Um, they um, uh, also they tried to, you know, prosecute. They tried to file complaints with the general prosecutor, uh, the PA, about these smear campaigns, and nothing has been happening. And then while we were doing and conducting a research, uh, we also tried to, you know, highlight the occupation's role in shrinking space. For 
for women act, for women activists uh, as well. And then during the midst of our research, the demonstration uh, uh, calling for justice against the assassination of Nizar Banat happened, and then they targeted, uh, they used a gender um, aspect uh, during the demonstrations by targeting women uh, and uh, you know beating women up. Uh, stealing their phones and then publishing personal information on these phones uh, onto pu onto the public uh, using social media platforms and creating fake accounts uh, of women. And this is something uh, that was unprecedented by the PA actually. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it wasn't something that happened before in terms of having it become you know, an organized thing. And it wasn't also something that was new. I knew a day before uh, a family friend who happened to work uh, with the PA told me that they were going to attack women and steal their phones. So it wasn't something that was unplanned. It wasn't something that was based on an individual action. It was something that was uh, organized and planned and structured before it happened. Uh, I just wanted to ask you also about, um, you had mentioned land grabbing as a major phenomenon that Bisan is, has been working on. Um, what is the situation now? Has it increased or decreased in the past years? And, and how has that uh, impacted? Uh, and, and, you know, I just want to relate that to another question on uh, your the work that you're known for on economic, social, and cultural rights, and, and, and how you feel that work is received um, within Palestine and Israel and in the international community as related to civil and political rights. So those are two questions. I think maybe uh, I can talk uh, more about uh, um, socioeconomic and cultural rights in Palestine, and then Ubay can uh, broaden more about the land grabbing. Mm -hmm. uh, our work as, as a center, we've always worked on socioeconomic rights of Palestinians. Uh, we've talked about unemployment, education, uh, you know, uh, health uh, rights or the social determinants of health uh, within the Palestinian context. Uh, we work with uh, a lot of uh, human, uh, a lot of grassroots organizations and youth groups uh, uh, with, around the West Bank. And uh, we try to raise awareness about these particular issues uh, within uh, different community, communities uh, around the West Bank. And our work with grassroots organizations has a bottom-up structure where we uh, talk to our partners and we see what kinds of needs that they have within their communities and uh, what they want to talk about within their communities. And this is how we implement our programs. This is how we create our projects. It's uh, by finding out what kinds of need, like what kind of needs that they have within their particular society, like communities, and we work within different initiatives and within different socioeconomic and cultural rights, uh, depending on the needs of each uh, uh, area and each community. Uh, and we have been working. Um, on doing a lot of research, and our research, we try to get policy recommendations. We don't do just research for the sake of research. We try to find uh, uh, recommendations and policy recommendations that would better develop the Palestinian community. And within our research, we try to come up with new programs and projects that we can implement that throughout our research we think would be more impactful within the Palestinian community. Um, I think the work of civil society organizations has become more difficult throughout the years because uh, we are donor dependent, unfortunately, as civil society organizations in Palestine. And within the past you know, 15 years, the funding has been drying up more and more. So this has caused a lot of problems for the civil society organizations because it's not easy to you know to keep doing this impact that you believe in and to keep doing this work for your community, but at the same time always having to also abide by you know the sense of you know international donor uh, needs and their you know uh, uh, their idea of what they want to do as you know donors as well. Thanks, uh, Ubay. Do, do you want to tackle the land grabbing and, I mean, general situation there? Okay, of course, land grabbing has increased, but we looked at it from uh, also a political economy perspective. 
because we try to look not because usually land grabbing studies in the West Bank usually focus on the Israeli occupation alone. And we looked at it from a uh, rights holders perspective, the small farmer. What are policies that are uh, uh, contributing to land grabbing and to Palestinian farmers losing their land? Of course, we covered the occupation, the laws, the Ottoman uh, laws that are in effect. Um, we'll be happy to share that. But we also looked at two other parts, the part of the Palestinian Authority and the part of big business. So, and donor organizations actually also on donor implemented programs on the ground. So we looked how these three also, how these four interact together to create either an environment where farmers can uh, keep their lands, we have productive lands, keep, uh, sustain their ways of living, sustain their livelihoods, or uh, that they are uh, being pushed out through various mechanisms out of their lands. Unfortunately, what we found out that these four mechanisms interact uh, uh, together and cause a major, uh, uh, I would say, uh, pushing out movement for the farmers out of their lands, especially small farmers where they are being impoverished, being forced to sell their lands. Uh, and this is on top of the Israeli restrictions, confiscations, settler attacks, uh, all of that. One of the things that we talked about, for example, is when uh, development organizations come and suggest uh, uh, cash or uh, cash crops, crops that are intended to earn fast uh, money, income for farmers that are uh, directed at export without taking into account the Israeli restrictive measures on the Palestinian economy. What they have done actually was put farmers in huge debts and contributed for them being bankrupt. While approaches that are sustainable, that would have helped uh, promote agriculture and would have helped promote or, and protect the agricultural life on, in these areas, uh, like agroecology, they have not taken any uh, or enough, I think, attention to their potential. In uh, another aspect for the land grabbing, we also looked at the role of the PA, whether it was on policy level or in even presidential decrees confiscating different and various parts of lands uh, for the benefit of the top echelon uh, of uh, the PA. And unfortunately, also we found out that the second biggest land grabber after the occupation and the settlers, of course, is uh, PA. Okay, uh, I had one question about, um, I think one of you referred to the need for more international protection measures. Um, can you elaborate on that? Uh, and, and also your general uh, experience uh, with the international community, whether it's donors, the UN, you know, other parts of the system. Um, so I think mainly when we talk about we have seen a lot of statements from a lot of EU countries. We have seen, uh, you know, a lot of uh, statements saying that the designation is baseless or there is no evidence and whether like waiting for evidence all the time as well. I think that is great. We do, uh, you know, we do appreciate these statements. We do think that they come a long way into uh, supporting civil society in Palestine, but at the same time, they lack practical uh, interventions. So the statements do not protect us as employees from getting arrested. They do not protect us from, uh, you know, uh, having our organizations raided. They do not protect us from, um, uh, you know, having uh, Israel, uh, you know, I don't know, harass any of, of the employees at all. So there are no protection mechanisms because also, um, there is a sense of impunity that Israel has that they feel that they do not, no one's going to hold them accountable for their actions. So they can do whatever they want. And what we're saying about protection uh, mechanisms, I cannot, you know, personally say this is the protection I want as a, you know, as an, as an employee. But I do ask for practical steps against and to hold Israel accountable for their actions against civil society in Palestine. Because it is very um, absurd that as an employee working as 
basically just working in Palestine can become illegal. Working in Palestine for a civil society organization can get an employee arrested. It's absurd. And this is something that the international community should address, and not just in statements. Statements are good, but they're not enough. Um, can I also elaborate on that? Is it possible? Can I elaborate here yeah, also? Please, please. Okay. So when we're talking about protection mechanisms, we are talking about doing two main things. The first one is highlighting the cases of the Palestinian civil society, like this panel is doing. I think this is very important, the cases, the issues, the struggles. But also holding perpetrators uh, accountable uh, that are committing and uh, these kinds of human rights violations. And this cannot happen, uh, um, and the names actually of perpetrators have become well known uh, through the documentation work of human rights organizations, uh, through the publication of uh, videos, uh, names, military commanders, names, etc., that are part of these violations. For example, when uh, talking about uh, these entities that are, or these people that have names that have been identified, I think it's also important to find them on a list, for example, of uh, people that are violating basic human rights. And we think that it's also important to hold them accountable through UN systems for the Israeli army that is, for example, being documented to violate children's rights, to violate, to uh, carry out an illegal occupation of other uh, territory, and also holding out the political and military commanders of this army accountable. And these mechanisms, I think they are in place. They need the political will to activate them. We've seen them activated in the case of Ukraine and Russia. And I think that uh, if they can be activated there, there, then they should also be activated in the case of Palestine to stop this deterioration of the basic human rights. Um, thanks very much. I had one final question. Um, I think what is coming out in your uh, testimony and from information we have on on the um, you know extensive work that Bisan has done is that um, in spite of the severe restrictions uh, because of occupation and the you know activities of occupation authorities um, the Palestinian Authority um, could be doing a lot more to uh, you know, uphold the economic, social, cultural rights and other rights, um, and as you just mentioned, uh, reduce the land grabbing. Uh, can you speak a bit more about their responsibility and their um, accountability? Uh, for us, the main issue with, uh, is the presence of the occupation. It is the perpetrator and the enabler of all other violations, human rights violations. For the PA, the most important recommendations that we have in all of our report is the democratization of the Palestinian Authority and the democratization of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which is the political umbrella under which the PA was established, actually. So when we're talking about the democratization, we're talking about having accountable leadership. We are talking about having a separation of uh, authorities between uh, legislative, uh, executive, and judicial. We are talking also about upholding the rule of law. Those are absent, but those could not, the PA could not practice these if it was, if this wasn't actually enabled and facilitated by the presence first of the uh, occupation and uh, its relationship with the Palestinian security forces and human rights violations. And on a second level, by, I would say, also um, um, uh, by also having the support of international uh, or uh, third states to the PA security apparatus that are looking the other way on, on human rights violations 
uh, in order to maintain the security coordination between the PA and Israel that is benefiting no one except uh, the continuation of uh, human rights violations against the Palestinian population and the continued subjugation of the Palestinian population for the occupation. This does not dissolve the Israeli occupation of its responsibilities. They have interfered in our local elections, and this is actually a report that we will publish with uh, the UN agency in uh, later this month uh, on uh, uh, political participation for youth, women, and people with disabilities uh, in the local elections, where we actually were able to uh, uh, see and uh, document uh, Israeli and, uh, interference and even PA interference in the local elections and the arrests of candidates, the arrests of people working for certain lists, and the persecution of people that are trying to change the status quo. But this kind of, I would say, several layers of interaction of human rights violations cannot be enabled unless there is also uh, the coordination, security coordination between the PA and the occupation state of Israel, and the international support for this kind of mechanism on the expense of the democratization and the respect for human rights and equal rights for the Palestinian people. Look, just a, a very quick question, please, um, Mr. Alaboudi. You referred earlier to the meeting that was unable to proceed earlier today. Could you just yeah. say a little bit more about what happened and why it happened? Yes. Uh, um, um, people in uh, Palestinians uh, are demanding, the Palestinian people are demanding democratization. And uh, uh, Palestinians from all over historic Palestine and the diaspora came together demanding that the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which is the political entity for representing Palestinians, to be democratized through general elections where all Palestinians can participate and choose the political leadership. This has had heavy crackdown from the Palestinian Authority. There was hate speech on it. Uh, on Saturday, they were supposed to hold uh, the general conference in one hall on the West Bank in Ramallah. Uh, pressure was put on the municipalities of Ramallah and Albira in order not to host the event. So they decided to host it in a smaller hall that belongs to the conference. And uh, this hall is quite adjacent to Bissan Center, but also the entire building became surrounded and became like a military barracks. Today, the same group of people, but they were able to successfully hold it uh, via Zoom. Uh, today, the same group of people tried to hold a press conference in order to give responses to the hate speech that's being delivered against them, to the instigations that is being, they are being called traitors, the people advocating for the democratic elections by PA officials. They are being called agents for third states, they are being called, uh, they are being called that they want to destroy the national uh, project. So they will try to hold a press conference today. Among them was uh, uh, were former uh, Palestinian uh, legislative council members, including Dr. Hassan Khreshe, who was the deputy of uh, the last uh, legislative council and also a member, I think, of the first legislative council. Uh, among them were distinguished people from civil society organizations, but the PA came and prevented them from holding this press conference in order to explain to the general public or that what their program is and how they are pushing for democratization of the PLO. Um, you have one more? Or you... no, I was just... Yeah, yeah. I, I was just going to comment. Um, that the investigation that we've begun this week, the scope of our work, covers the situation of civic space generally in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, Gaza and Israel. And although we are focusing this week on the terrorist designation on your organisations, we will be looking at broader issues about civic space. And the kinds of events that occurred this morning are relevant for that. Um, so too we will be looking at the death of uh, Nizar Banat, and the demonstrations that followed and the way in which they were treated. So we would welcome and invite any information you have on these issues 
as part of our broader investigation into civic space. Thank you. We'll have yeah, and these investigations tomorrow. will um, continue in a series of public hearings. This is just the first of them. Uh, so, um, Mr. Alabudi and Ms. Hussain, I really want to thank you for your time and your um, patience and your, 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 you know, taking the time to answer the questions and preparing your testimonies. Uh, we will now take a, take a short break. Uh, we come back at 4.35 and we'll be hearing testimony from the Union of Agricultural Work Committees. So we're back at 4.35. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Mr. Alabudi. Thank you. Thank you.